now that we have a nice analytic expression for the Fourier transform of an impulse sampled signal, let's go ahead and work a specific example. Let's see what happens when we do impulse sampling of a sinusoid. So let's start with the signal x of t, and let's let x of t equal just cosine of pi t. So the sinusoid has a radial frequency of pi. So if you do the math, and uh, that turns out that's a uh, frequency of a half hertz, which means that it repeats every half of a second. So this is the cosine that we're going to deal with and we're going to sample. So omega equals pi. So like I said, you can do the math, and that turns out to be a period of 2, or a fundamental frequency of 1 over 2, or 1 half. What do we know? We know that in the frequency domain, x of t gives us x of omega, and we can go to our Fourier transform table, and we can look this up. This is either something you just remember, or you can go look up in your Fourier transform table. We know that a cosine will give us two impulses, one at positive the frequency, so there's positive, and one at negative the frequency. So this impulse right here is actually located at omega equals pi, and this impulse here is actually located at omega equal minus pi. But we have two impulses in the frequency domain. And then there's the scale factor of pi that you have to put in there when you're working in radial frequency. So in the frequency domain, we know what this signal looks like. And we can go ahead and sketch that. Just two impulses, one at plus and minus pi. This is what the spectrum looks like. Let's compute the Fourier transform of the impulse sampled signal. Conceptually, we know what's going to happen. When we do impulse sampling of x of t, this picture is going to be replicated up and down the frequency axis at multiples of our sampling frequency, omega s. So we can go ahead and write out the math for this. This is the equation we had last time. x sub delta, the impulse sampled spectrum, is equal to 1 over t s, and then this infinite collection of shifted copies of x of omega and they're all shifted in multiples of omega s. So to evaluate this, I can leave 1 over t sub s there. What am I going to do? I'm going to replace x of omega right here with what it's actually equal to for this problem. For this specific problem, we're working with an x of omega equal to two impulses. So when I substitute in here, I can substitute in the first term, this first impulse, pi delta of omega plus pi, but I have to replace every single omega with omega minus k omega s. So that's what I've done here. I took this first term and I replaced its omega with omega minus k omega s, and then there was already a plus pi, so I had to leave that alone. So that's all we've done here. We've just substituted in the spectrum that we're working with into this mathematical equation. Similarly for this second term, I would like to write down delta of omega minus pi, but I have to replace the omega with omega minus k omega s. So that's what I did here, omega minus k omega s, then minus pi, and then in parentheses. So this is just an infinite collection of impulses spaced at multiples of omega s. It's this picture replicated up and down the frequency axis. So let's take a look at some examples and see what this looks like for different values of omega s. First, let's just start with the signal we're working with. Here is the signal we're working with, x of t. It's just this cosine. It has a period of 2. That's why it starts at 0 and repeats here at time 2, which means that it has a fundamental frequency of 1 half. And in the frequency domain, we know what the spectrum looks like. I plotted it right here just again. It's just a set of two impulses, one at negative pi and one at pi, and they have a height slash density of pi. So this is the signal we're starting with. What happens when I do impulse sampling? Well, with impulse sampling, we have the parameter omega s. For this specific slide, I've chosen omega s equal to 8 pi. Another way of thinking about that is I've sampled with a period of one-fourth. So if you look at this picture right here on the left, I've been sampling every one-fourth of a second. So I sampled at time zero, I sampled at time a fourth, time a half, three-fourths, one, etc. There's a sample in time every one-fourth of a second. So all these impulses over here 
are the impulse samples, and then I can compute omega s using this equation. Omega s is always equal to 2 pi over t sub s, since t sub s in this case is 1 fourth, the 4 flips on top, and we get 8 pi. So in the frequency domain, we know what's going to happen. My original set of impulses that look like this are going to get repeated up and down the frequency axis in multiples of 8 pi. So that's why there's this other cluster here at 8 pi, one here at minus 8 pi, and then dot 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 for forever. There's another set at 16 pi, 24 pi, 32 pi, etc. Also, you can see how this has changed. We used to have just a height of pi, but we know that we get multiplied by 1 over ts. 1 over ts is 4, so it's turned into 4 pi. Let's look at another example. So same signal we're dealing with, we're just impulse sampling at a different rate. In this example, I've chosen t sub s, the sampling period, to be 1. So if you look over here on the left, we're sampling every 1 second. There's a sample at time 0, there's a sample at time 1, a sample at time 2, and so on. So we're sampling every 1 second. If I compute the sampling rate, that means that omega s is equal to 2 pi over t sub s with t sub s equal to 1, which means that omega s is equal to 2 pi. This means in the frequency domain, my impulses are going to repeat, be repeated in multiples of 2 pi. So my first set gets shifted up and placed right here. So that's interesting. This bottom impulse, when I shift it up 2 pi, actually lands on the top impulse. And that's why we have a value of 2 here. Our scale factor that we have to introduce is 1 over t sub s. t sub s in this case is 1, so our scale factor is 1. But you notice that I have a 2 pi here. And that's because when this got shifted up, it landed on the top impulse and stacked up, so to speak. <clears throat> so we have these impulses spaced in multiples of 2 pi up and down the frequency axis. 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, 8 pi, and also in negative frequency, minus 2 pi, minus 4 pi. And we can still pick out our original spectrum, it's still right here, but at this point we are now sampling at what we call the Nyquist rate. We're sampling at two times the frequency. The frequency is a half, two times a half is one, so we're sampling one time per second. This is actually as low as we can go to avoid aliasing. And finally, let's look at what happens when we sample at a rate that's too low. So in this case, now I'm sampling very infrequently. My t sub s is 3, meaning I'm sampling only every 3 seconds. So I have a sample at time 0, I have a sample at 3, a sample at 6. They're really spaced out in time. If you had to connect these impulse samples smoothly, you would be tempted to draw it like this dashed line over here. And this dashed line, you can tell, looks kind of like a very slowly varying sinusoid, a sinusoid of a much slower frequency. Why is that? Well, we can explain that in the frequency domain. Our original spectrum had an impulse at minus pi and pi. We are sampling at t sub s equals 3, so I can compute what the sampling rate is. That means omega s is 2 pi over 3, or 2 pi, or 2 thirds pi. So when I shift my original spectrum up and down the frequency axis, I'm only shifting it up in increments of two-thirds pi. So what does that mean? That means when I shift up the first time, minus one gets shifted up to minus a third. Or there's pi is in front of that, so minus one pi gets shifted up to minus pi over three. Similarly, when this gets shifted up, it only gets shifted up to here. So you can see what happens. Since I'm shifting my original spectrum just up and down in very small increments, if I was to look at this picture here on the right, it looks like that is my original spectrum. But it's not. That's actually the aliased version that's shifted up, and it has a frequency of pi over 3. That's why this sinusoid over here looks like it has a frequency of pi over 3. So this picture over here really explains the concept of aliasing. When we sample incorrectly, the sampled spectrum, you can't look at it anymore and pick out the original spectrum. These aliased frequencies look like a different frequency, which means in the time domain our sinusoid no longer looks like the correct frequency. 
So sampling the sinusoid with impulses provides kind of a concrete example of exactly what happens in the frequency domain with the spectrum and why aliasing occurs. Let's go ahead and work a little math just to figure out an equation for how to predict the alias frequency. We just saw that when we sample this sinusoid incorrectly, it ends up kind of turning into a sinusoid of a different frequency. How do we figure out what that frequency is? Well, there's actually a set of equations we can use to figure this out. It's pretty straightforward. First of all, the alias frequency is always less than or equal to half of the sampling frequency. So we always know that's going to be true. And then the equation we can use to figure out this alias frequency is equation two right here. It says that the alias frequency is equal to the absolute value of the original frequency minus m times f sub s, where m is this free parameter. m can be zero or one or two or three. So we can use this system of equations to actually solve for the sampling frequency that we will see when aliasing occurs. So let's do a little example. Let's say that I am sampling a sinusoid whose frequency is 10,000 hertz. So f ridge is 10,000. Let's say that I'm sampling at just a rate of 3,000. So we know that aliasing is going to occur because I haven't sampled at twice the largest frequency. I can use this equation to figure out what the alias frequency actually is. The alias frequency will be 10,000 minus 3,000 times m under the condition that the alias frequency has to be less than or equal to f sub s over 2. So if I actually plug into f sub s over 2, I get 3,000 over 2 is 1,500. So as I evaluate this equation for different values of m, I'm looking for the first time where I get a value for the alias frequency that is less than or equal to 1,500. So now you just try it. You say m equals 0. When m is 0, I get 10,000 minus 0, which is 10,000. But 10,000 is not less than or equal to 1,500. So m0 doesn't work. What about m equals 1? This equation turns into 10,000 minus 3,000, which is 7,000. Well, again, 7,000 is not less than 1,500, so m equals 1 doesn't work. What about m equals 2? When m is 2, I get 10,000 minus 6,000 is 4,000. Again, that doesn't satisfy being less than 1,500, so 2 doesn't work. What about m equals 3? Now I get 10,000 minus 3 times 3,000, which is 9,000. 9,000 is, or 10,000 minus 9,000 is just 1,000, which is less than 1,500. So m equals 3 works. So I get f aliased equals 1,000 hertz. So if we have happened to sample a sinusoid whose frequency was 10,000, and we sampled at a rate of 3,000, aliasing occurs, and my alias frequency will be equal to 1,000 hertz. So this system of equations is very useful. It lets us actually predict and compute the alias frequency.